Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Kerry Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Pat, welcome back. It's always such a joy. It really is. It's great to be with you again. Last time what you were sitting right here next to me where I am today in California, but um, we can How do is that this Walnut? Today. Is it Walnut Creek where the table group is? Uh, it's Lafayette, which is like one of the little Lafayette. neighborhood That's communities. Right. That's right. Walnut Creek yeah. is like the, the and, commercial uh, No, that was a lot of fun to actually be at world headquarters for the table group. You <laughs> gave me uh, the last copy you had of the motive, which had not been released yet. It was still like a binder. And I read it on the flight home. It was, it was, it was uh, one I'm going to remember for a long time. Oh, great. And thank you for your kindness and your generosity. It's just good to have you back. And like all of us, you know, this will probably broad, be broadcast in June, uh, but we're now four and a half months or whatever into the whole new world, the new order that we're in. But just, you know, you're a speaker and an author and I always meet you on the road and your world got turned upside down too. So talk for a minute about just the impact of the whole disruption of 2020 and how that impacted you personally and your company and what you do. Yeah, and you know, there's so many facets to this. It's hard to, to focus on one. Certainly my speaking business and, and many elements of our consulting business have been turned upside down or put an end to. And yeah. yet I've been busier than I've ever been. We're making less money than we probably ever have. By the grace of God, I mean, we're, we're gonna try to break even and that's gonna be our new normal for a few months here. We're like, yay. <laughs> and, um, but but we, uh, we're still really busy. We're just doing a lot for free. But more importantly, we're doing a lot of new things. And my, yeah. my sense of connection and meaning and contribution, I think, is higher than it's ever been. Hmm. Um, but it's been a, it took a, a couple of weeks for us to find our footing. But we have been innovating and getting more done. Our productivity has gone up by two and a half times at the table group during this time. And our challenge is, as we head back, this is my second day back in the office. We're yeah. not fully online yet, but... Our challenge is how do we how do we maintain that level of productivity when we get back in? Yeah, it's really interesting because there's the shock, right? And a right. lot of your work and the work of your team was in person consulting, um, in person speaking. You know, often to large audiences where you were, or working with Fortune 500 companies and CEOs, right? So you're doing all of that in the pocket, and that. That's right. That changed dramatically. So after the shock hit, how did you pivot? What did you do? Well, we, um, the demand, you know what it was, Carrie? What? Early on, a, a CEO, I'll even say who it was, it was the CEO of Silver Oak Winery, which is a well-known wine up here in the Napa Valley. And uh, they're a client of ours. And the CEO called us and said, hey, we want to know what Pat's thinking about what's going on here as it relates to leadership and everything else. And we were like, Really? And he's like, oh yeah, we want to know. And we were like, we started hearing from more clients and we thought, wow, I guess people do are looking for some insight about how this affects their organization. And we just needed a little bit of a wake up call. So we started reaching out to people. We got very intentional and said, our, our rallying cry during this crisis was going to be to make our team more cohesive and more innovative. Hmm. And so one of the things was let's reach out to people and say, we're here if, if you need us. And we did more you know, webinars and podcasts in that first, in those first few weeks, almost all for free. And um, we found that there was actually a lot of people that wa wanted advice. And so we had a new purpose. And, and so while we weren't traveling and doing typical keynotes, we were seeing there was a lot of people hungry for information. And the fact that I was sitting there in my underwear and a, and a, 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 a nicer shirt on top in my, in my office at home didn't seem to matter. <laughs> right. And so we took on a whole new, we, we said, it's not about revenue right now. It's about cohesiveness and innovation. And then doors started to open up and we were doing things that we would have never done had this not happened. Can you give me an example of some of the things you were doing that you would have never done? Absolutely. Okay. So. So right before, Carrie, right before 
the, the shutdown, we yeah. had our annual, our second annual conference in Dallas, Texas. Right. And it's called the Unconference. And, and we, like, literally, we were like, wow, I, I wonder if this, this coronavirus thing is going to impact these events like this. And we said, no, everybody said not. And then two days after our conference ended, things started to close down. It's, it happened so fast. Wow. So we were in a room for two days with a thousand people um, right before this broke. Thank <laughs> the Lord. I don't think a single person got sick there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but so we had just had this big conference. We had just released a book and we had just recorded a TEDx talk. Um, and then everything shut down. Yeah. And we were like, what are we going to do? And so we, you know what we did? We said, we also had this idea like, you know what we should do? This was before the, the coronavirus. We said, we should one day have like a network of organizational consultants around the world and just serve them. Hmm. And we thought, yeah, we'll take eight months to study that and to plan that and to launch it and to put marketing material. And in 10 days, we launched something and had thousands of people from all over the world from the center of Italy, in Milan, in the middle of the coronavirus, to South Africa, to Poland, to Asia, to Australia. We had thousands of people that became part of this network. We named it in a day. We launched it in two days. We had our first um, podcast. And we, we ramped up this new program in a way that we would never have been so quick and dirty with. And I think it was 90% as successful as if we had spent nine months planning it. I, you know, that story is amazing and it's not unique in the leaders I, I talked about. Even in right. our own company, we pivoted immediately and we released a course 10 days after we thought of the idea. So, right. you know, take our usual timeline would have been months, right? Months of development, shooting, pro film crew. Can you talk about the expedited timeline and maybe some permanent lessons from that? Like clearly you don't want to be pivoting every three days, you know, in the future, but there must've been a lesson in that somewhere, Pat. Yeah. And there was a huge lesson. And the, the lesson is that sometimes we think we need to be perfect and we, we don't, we know more than we think we do. I'm a huge believer in 80, 20, and that is yeah. 20% of the analysis gives you 80% of the answer. And, and the other thing is, when you're not afraid to put something out because you're focused on just the need, you actually do a better job. And so we said, there's these organizational consultants out there that need us. So let's just serve them. And, and that rallying cry that an emergency brings on hmm. is something that we've always said to clients is you should perform with the same sense of unity and clarity as though it were a crisis. Oh, gosh, yeah, that's right. You did write about that in Silos, Politics, and Turf Wars. Right. Oh, wow, you're, yeah. you're fantastic. Remember it. And so we always said, like, what's the best department at a hospital for not having silos? Well, it's the emergency room. Yeah. So why doesn't every department work like the emergency room where you're so, and it's because they don't really have a clear sense of priority and, <sighs> and unity. And so we've been saying that for years, but even for us, the crisis brought that out. And that's why I say we're going to go back to work and keep that same sense of, of clarity and, and urgency. Now, that doesn't mean you create a false crisis or that you get messy. But right. boy, I think we've been over perfecting things and we've been polishing things for too much. And, and this whole idea of perfection and over engineering is something that I really hope in the worldwide economy I think the companies that get that are going to really come out of this successful. Any other early lessons? Uh, we're recording this about a month in advance. So 60 days uh, into the whole shutdown of the world and recalibration of the world. Any other lessons immediately that, that spring up to you? Yes. Well, the, the biggest thing we found was that, and this is where my change in, in understanding the virtual, I, I'd always been pretty, pretty down on virtual teams. Yeah. Because I thought, you know, you got to be in person. I still believe there's something about being across the table from somebody. And that's why we call it the table group. You know, you got to be together. But one of the things we found was that, and it was brought about by the crisis, but it doesn't need to have a crisis to do it, is that when we started getting on what we call, what we do is Zoom now, but on virtual technology and seeing people in their homes, like I'm seeing you right now. Yeah. And we actually poured into one another's lives more, even more during virtual times 
because we could see their dog or their 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 infant or their or their the chaos at home and we had a much more human interaction and so we and we were intentional about that we really poured into one another and our team became more cohesive more loving i will use the word during that time than had we been together in person because when you get dressed and you go take a shower and you you shave and you put your stuff on and you go to work you, there's a certain persona that you're projecting when you roll out of bed and you're on a call at 8.30 in the morning because you got to figure things out, I think we got more intimate. Mm. And Yeah. you Did you do a whole episode of At the Table about this? I think yes. you did. Of your yeah. podcast. Yeah, because I'm, I'm remembering this and that was one of my questions for you. And I think you said, Pat, that you had prided yourself on being a very familial, honest, like relational organization and having been at the table group myself, I can attest to that, that it feels right. more like family than an office. And yet you said that virtual technology, which you were quote opposed to actually accelerated and deepened the connection that you have. I'd love you to drill down on that a little bit more. Yeah. It's, it's, I think it made us be a little bit more intentional and you know, it, it, yeah. it's interesting there was, there was a lack of distraction when you're sitting there and you're really looking at all of your people in one place. And, and, and there's something else about seeing yourself. <laughs> I think that I've, I'd never, for years, Carrie, I've been thinking, you know, I should really have somebody videotape me so I can see how I act. And I, I think it's just cowardice. I've always been, oh, that's going to be awful. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Your but, whole resting face thing. Is that what you're getting at? Like, yeah. you know, I have the and, worst and, resting face. I know that. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's terrible. I have a, a face that when I'm mildly disappointed in someone, it looks like I want to take their head off. And I mean, my wife has told me this for years. And so at my office now, they say, you have the face. And I'm like, oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry. My kids tell me too. But the point is, we got yeah. so much more intentional about being personal with each other. And I, it went to a whole new level. And I, I refuse to go backward when we come back to work. I am going to be even more interested in Cody's daughter than I was before because I never saw her. And then I, I got to see her in the background and I got to see Lindsay, his wife, go by and talk to her. And I thought, why do we not do this all the time? Wow. So I think that the new world of work is going to have higher standards for personal interest in one another's lives because it's really hard for human beings to go backward in intimacy. Hmm. So if we go back to work and people go, okay, now I really cared about you in your life during that time. Now we're back. So probably let's keep the personal discussion to a minimum. <laughs> right, right. I think that's going to be painful. I'd love to try out a Zoom theory with you. I've been on Zoom and doing, we were talking before we started rolling. Uh, you know, I've been doing virtual work for 25 years, largely because the small churches I started at had no office. And there's lots of reasons. And I've worked in buildings too, and we built buildings, the whole deal. But I'm not... I'm not a stranger to virtual work. However, in the last two months, this is deeply intensified. There's a right. big difference between 90 minutes of Zoom meetings or video chats a day and five hours. And right. I've found it to be much more exhausting. But it is interesting because uh, I've been really trying to process this because I'm trying to figure out what is happening and I want to test out a theory on you. Do you think People are, because the argument is people are not focused at home. You know, you got kids crawling around and dogs and all that. I wonder if people are more focused on Zoom because you're right. I'm very conscious of my body language. I can see myself. I know what face I need to make. I'm also making full eye contact with you. Um, you know, if I'm sitting here like this interviewing you, looking out my window, you're like, Carrie, are you there? But I do that all the time in a meeting. Like if we're, if we're meeting in person, I feel like there's greater permission to look out the window. I'd just love you to riff on that for a minute. I totally agree. It's, okay. It, it's, it's counterintuitive. You think when you're in person, you're going to be even more focused, but I think we have permission to wander. Right. Or, and, or check email or... Yes. Right. Yeah. You know, so, so the, I think you're right on that. I will say this too about myself. Hmm. The fact that after that meeting is over, I can run down the hallway and wrestle with one of my boys or just check in with them or go wake them up and tease them for, for 15 minutes makes me more focused when I'm in the meeting. Like, like it, the, the, the reward for being done with the meeting, I love being around my family. 
Mm. And so have taking a break and 10 minutes with my 17 year old makes me that much better when I come back where today I'm at the office. Cody is sitting here with me. He's going to be away from his beautiful daughter, Quinn, who's almost two years old. And when you're, you, you, you wander, you think more about them and you feel like, well, but boy, when you can run down the hall and see your wife and then come right back and be on, I find that it actually gives me more energy to be focused when I'm there. Isn't that interesting? Would your team, I mean, you probably haven't pulled them, but if you were to ask your team, do they like Pat better in person or on a meeting in a, in a Zoom, like a virtual meeting, would they say your performance differs at all in a virtual context than an in-person? I'm just curious. I think they would say it does. Yeah. I think I am even more, no, no, even more is the wrong word <laughs> because I'm a pretty volatile guy, but I think during the crisis, and I think part of it is the, is the context and the technology, I, I'd say I've been more measured and more calm, more intentional. Um, I, and I will attribute some of that to being around my family. Like oh. working from home, and, 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 and having a little bit of my wife and a little bit of my kids and a little bit of home and, and then being online, I think it, it made me a more well-rounded person. Um, and so I, I think that's part of it. Now, here's the interesting thing, though, Carrie. As we go back to work, yeah. see, the beauty of this time was that everyone was remote. Right. So when, when there's 100% participation remotely, there's an equality there. But if I had four people in this room today and four at home, I think that the difference between the way we interact in person and the way we interact remotely might leave some of those remote people feeling out of the loop. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. you know what we're going to do? What are We're going to start, even when we're in the office, like we're going to do a morning call because every day at 845, we do a morning call where we just check in with one another. And um, we're going we're gonna to keep doing that and if, if not everyone is in the office, we're going to have everybody go to their office and do it on, on Zoom. Even oh, if you're so in the next office. Even if you're in over. the office, everyone's yeah. going to do that via Zoom. Yeah. Because it makes those, like we have two people now who are remote most of the time, and it gives them a sense of actually participating fully. And it gets us all a little bit more focused. Where when, when we're in the office and we do those check ins, man, we drift and we change the subject. And I'm probably the worst violator of that. ENFP, so I think we're right? going to continue to try to preserve some of that equality of remote work um, even after this is over. Yeah. That was one of my, my questions I wanted to ask you. If uh, let's say you could turn a light switch and the world goes back to normal, the world that we knew it, which I'm not sure it will, but let's just say for argument's sake, it would. Right. What have you pulled out of these first few months of the disruption that you're like, we're not going back. We are going to keep these practices. We're going to change this. I've heard you speculate about that a little bit, and I'd love to hear a little bit more from you. Yeah, well, one thing we're going to do is we're going to continue to embrace the flexibility of this. And I have a pretty flexible attitude, but like we had a lot of employees in our office who just always felt bad. Like if I had to work, if they had to work from home, they felt like a slacker. Now right. that we know you can actually work from home, do great work, and be a better person because you, if your kid needs you that day, your son or daughter or your husband or wife, that that's okay. And so we're going to embrace that flexibility more. We are going to continue to, to lean into intimacy more and, and demonstrate slowing down to go fast, taking the time to, to meet somebody where they are in their life makes the meeting that much better. So we're, we're going to reject the false draw to efficiency because when you, when you're slightly inefficient with your time with a person, you actually are more effective because you're fully human with them. Wow. And then we're going to, we're not going to go back to unnecessary protocol. We're going to have a meeting and we're going to say, you guys, I think, look at during the crisis, we made some of these decisions in, in an hour and didn't drag them on for a week. Let's see if we can't continue to do some of that now. Those are good lessons. I heard you on your at the table podcast, even say you may try to avoid rush hour, right? If you, you guys are in California, right? Yeah. Cody said just yesterday, hey, why do we all commute? And, and this is what I think people should do in general. It takes, there are people in the Bay Area who drive two hours each way to work. Yeah. You know, it, you know in Toronto, what do they call that one highway? That, oh, the 401? Oh, it's yeah. a disaster. Yeah, right. 400, I've, 401, QEW. Ugh. I've been on that. And I thought, yeah. wow, you got some good traffic here too. But why not do the first hour of work 
and Cody was just saying this yesterday, at home, mm-hmm. and then commute for, because you know, and when you're not in a commute hour, it can cut, get cut down by more than half. I am 60 minutes from Pearson Airport uh, with no traffic and 90 minutes away with traffic. And the mileage doesn't change. It's just 100% time of day. So I think we're all going to be a little bit more flexible. And then when we are in the office together, yesterday, Cody and I came in and in four and a half hours got more done than we'd normally get done in a full day because we were continuing to work in this quick and dirty way. Yeah. Yeah. So a compressed timeline, uh, more personal connection with your team, which was really refreshing to hear you say, say, because I mean, you've been the guy for decades now who've been encouraging corporate leaders to become um, well, you know, we call it the soft skills and you say they're not soft at all. They really reflect on your bottom line, but that's intriguing. Another question I've been asking every leader I can talk to is this, and I just love your take on it. Do you see this, the whole thing, the global meltdown, the coronavirus, the halting of life as we know it, do you think it's an interruption or a disruption? In other words, is it gonna, are we gonna go back to some semblance of normal? I think it's gonna be an interruption. Okay. Not a disruption. Now, there are certain elements are going to be, when I say the disruption, it'll be a good thing. And like, it's disrupting in a good way. Yeah, like, I guess it's I a question, gonna, is this temporary change or permanent change? Some of them, if for smart companies, I think they're going to find out that there's some permanent things they should take from it. Ah, gotcha. But other than that, I think that, gosh, it's so interesting. If you look at the way media works today, and we we did a podcast yesterday that hasn't gone out yet about the, the unreliability of data and how r- true leaders don't make decisions based on data. They make decisions based on intuition informed by data. Right. And during this time, for some reason, everybody panicked and said, what's the data tell us? <laughs> and the data has been wildly inconsistent and often wrong. And so I think that if we, if we didn't get so freaked out when this first started, we might have had a little, but I think nobody wanted to be the one to say, I made a huge mistake and it cost people lives and I totally get that. Mm. But I think that going forward, we're going to be a little bit more tempered in how we look at some of these things. Yeah. How do you think business will be different moving forward? I've, I've talked to tons of CEOs who are rethinking square footage, who are looking at, uh, you know, they've changed their mind on remote work. Uh, the airline industry, will that be different? Like what, what do you think? What, what do you think? Are there any perma changes, any permafrost that will have yeah. a hard time flying? I think people are going to question travel a little bit more, yeah. which will have a percentage impact on, on that. I think we used to get in a plane and go, yeah, I have to fly, you know, three hours to have a meeting. I mean, I had a meeting with a CEO recently and we had to confront him about behavioral issues and we had to do it on Zoom and it was fantastic. Really? And I was shocked. And and then right after the meeting, I said to my colleague, I said, hey, you know, we should have the CFO and the head of HR come to our office. And, and I thought, no, no, we could do it on Zoom. Isn't it? And, and three months ago, you would have been like, no way that I have to get on a plane to see this guy. Exactly. Wow. So travel is not going to go away. Meeting space is not going to go away. But on a percentage, there's going to be a percentage decrease in it because people realize now part of that is because this technology has improved too. just right. today, Carrie, for the first time in two months, we had a really bad zoom call in terms. Of it was really, it cut in and out and people were frozen. And I said to everybody, if, if zoom had been like this at the beginning, I don't think we would have been using it. Yeah, you're right. We had the same thing on zoom. I don't know if there was a bad day on zoom or what happened. Yeah. But. I think there was something was going on today. Yeah. Um, but if that were the norm, but I really do think technology has been a big part of that. But again, there's some, you know, when people put up a background behind them, I, t- I ask them to take it down. I don't want to see a false understanding of who they are. I want to see who they really are. You know, I've, I've got the same instinct on that. I mean, we joke around with it sometimes and make really stupid backgrounds as a joke, but oh yeah, yeah like yeah. this is me. This is my basement. This is my office. And you know, and I see you. I know you're at the table group. I know exactly the the unit that you're in, right? You take but I'm, that little I'm kind of disappointed that I'm not home because you, I'm sure it, you would just like, oh, what's that thing on the wall? Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know he liked that kind of stuff, you know? Exactly. It's, it's wonderful. And I think that that kind of, I think we're going to become more more human, a little less buttoned down as a result of all this. So you did, if I'm not mistaken, your first virtual event too. You did an online summit. And yes. was that new for you? I'd love to unpack that. You know, here, so here's what happened, Carrie. We did that conference in Dallas and we, it, it was full 
And yeah. so, and after we were done, we were like, well, we're, you know what we should do? We should create, because people are doing virtual conferences, why don't we go back and select the very best interviews we did there and the very best keynotes we did and the very best moments and, and package this so people could, could take part in it. But instead of just selling it and letting people do it, we, we actually had a live virtual conference where Cody and I would talk about something and say, now we're going to go watch this clip from the conference where we interview Gary Kelly, the Southwest Airlines executive. And then he, we'd, we'd show the interview from the conference, which was very fancy and produced. And then we'd come back from, from my office and his office and we'd talk about it and debrief it. And we'd take questions from people who watched. And then we go, now we're going to go and see this keynote talk about this. So it was like this live, but with the use of recording. And I think it went really well. We would never... It would have taken us year, uh, months and months and months to figure that out. And we said, screw it. Let's just, let's just put something out there. And, and it worked really well. And so, you know, we tripled the number of people who got to see our conference. Some people came live and that tripled that number, watched it virtually. And it was, it was a lot of fun. Would you do that in the future? Or you think that was a temporary thing? No, I think we do it in the future. Yeah. yeah. I would think we do it in the future. And, and, and by the way, people can go on... Now, and, and, and it's like, there's people that are downloading it and watching it after the fact. They're watching a recorded version of us doing a live thing based on a recorded version. You know, it's like Inception. Like, <laughs> it's inception. I don't know where the reality yeah. ends. But, but we're learning to get a lot out of things online. And I have to tell you, being at home with my, I have a 14-year-old, a 17-year-old, and two 22-year-olds now. And the 22-year-olds are at college, but they, they come home every once in a while. And um, I've learned to benefit from, they're, they're like, Dad, check out this video. And I'm like, I didn't even know what all the things that were out there. And so I think as, as the population ages a little bit, more of the younger workers are, are like, I'm fine. I can, I can watch something for an hour on video and learn it. I don't need to get on a plane. Yeah. Yeah. What do you not miss about your old life, work or personal? And what have you enjoyed about these first few months in the disruption? Oh, I'm going to say this. I, it's overall been a huge blessing. Yeah. And it's hard to say that for, because of all the people that have been suffering, especially in the big cities and anywhere, because it's really you. tough and nobody would want that. And so God bless them all. But being, being with my family and knowing that every day after I was done and they were done, they weren't going to be off at some activity or they weren't going to be driving in traffic, but that we were actually going to be together. Um, I, I, I've had a lot of insomnia lately. Um, I have something called restless leg syndrome where your muscles kind of twitch oh, yeah. at night. And I get up and inevitably there's my 17 year old. And we, last night we were up at two 30 in the morning watching TV. And I was like, Casey, this is one of my favorite things in the world to do. <laughs> uh. Whereas in the past, you know, there's just so many activities, so many, even school, I will say this. I think my sons would say they about 25% of the time they spend at school is actually learning. Hmm. So much of it is protocol and commuting and administration and, going from class to class and, and all these other things. And they're like, man, I think I can get most of this done. I think homeschooling is going to have experience a boom. Yeah. I really do. You're a sports guy. Again, because I listen at the table, I think it was you who speculated, like, what do you think the impact is going to be on team sports? And this idea that you're at six nights a week at the diamond, at the field, at wherever oh. you happen to be. I think that youth sports has been one of the most dangerous um, idols in our society. Mm. And I think that everybody experiences it. As their kids get a little older, they're like, what's the purpose of this again? And I love sports. And I think it teaches people a lot about character. And I was an athlete and my kids are all totally into sports at college and high school and, and middle school, but it's been way overdone. And, and I think that you can practice two or three nights a week in high school and you don't need to be there every night for two and a half hours. So I mm. would say overall, it's been a blessing. It's been so sad for my kids because some of them had their careers end or their season end and, and that was too bad. But let me tell you, not having to be there every night and, and panic to get their homework done and driving constantly and us doing carpools, I hope society doesn't go fully back to that. The other thing is this, Carrie, I miss sports on TV, but it's kind of nice to come home and not turn on the Raptors Warriors game and let it occupy 90 minutes of my time 
almost by default. Yeah. So I've missed it, but I would say the overall impact has been a positive one. Hmm. You're also, uh, Pat, you're a person of faith, you're a Christian and uh, Roman Catholic. And so the very first time you've kind of had church online. Talk to us about that. That was a big change. Yes. And, um, and as a Catholic, you, you can't receive the Eucharist virtually. Right. 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 So going to Mass every week is really important. And so I've never been this long without going to Mass in my life. But the one thing we, we do is we've been very intentional about doing mass online once a week. And as a result of that, there has been something about sitting in the living room. My, my kids are much more liable, likely now to comment on what they see. And there's, there's a little bit more intentionality of the, it's like we're in our living room. There's four of us because um, the others are at college and we're watching it. And after the homily, they'll go, that wasn't very good. <laughs> or, wow, that was really interesting. Whereas in, in, when we're at mass, we're sitting there. You don't say anything to each other. You don't say in anything. In fact, if the music is really bad at mass, I'll look over to my wife and raise my eyebrow and she'll like give me the elbow. Like, don't do that. It looks like you're <laughs> criticizing. Where at, at my son, you know what he does? What? He fast forwards through bad songs. <laughs> <laughs> like, eh. we'll be, they're, like sometimes they'll sing a prayer and which is a beautiful thing. But if they sing it poorly, He'll stop it. We'll say the prayer as a family and he'll fast forward to the end of the song. <laughs> and and th- th- he's more engaged, you know? Interesting. He, he's more engaged. And you've been, you, you were telling me before, you visited a few different churches and uh, I'd love to, for you to reflect on that. We, you know, I have another apostolate that I started. Apostolate is just a, a, like a church related group called the Amazing Parish that teaches yes. parishes how to have to teamwork and leadership and and prayer and evangelization, all those kind of things. And so, um, so I work with parishes on this stuff. Over the, during this crisis, I, I did Easter Mass in Ireland, <laughs> and most of our Sunday Masses are, is this one bishop in Los Angeles named Bishop Barron who has this really simple Mass from his chapel, but it's really beautiful. And, and, and then we've done some others where my kids are like, oh, that was, that was so painful. <laughs> now, the liturgical sacramental part is always the same, which is great. Yeah. But the stuff around it, it's, it should be good. And so we have actually probably lowered our tolerance for mediocrity. Mm. And, 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 and there's, there's, there's a good and a bad part of that. The good part is that I'm hoping that churches in general realize that there's, I don't like to call it competition, but that they have a sense of like, raising their standards because other people have access now and have experienced excellence. I don't want them to be complete church shoppers because one of them is like, okay, who has the shortest service, the best donuts and the, <laughs> and the, the most amazing speaker, you know right, what I mean? Right. And th- so there's, there's positives and negatives of that. But overall, I hope that people learn from each other and the overall sense of liturgical excellence increases as a result of it. Yeah, and it's interesting. And I mean, I think I know you well enough to know that you take your faith very seriously. Yes. You've always been part of the local church. But yeah, it's a new day. So you've got tens of thousands of leaders, uh, most of whom or many of whom are church leaders or involved in their local church. What would you tell them about church moving forward? How do you think this is going to impact them? Well, you know, it's interesting. I think that, you know, and, and as a Catholic with very many evangelical and Protestant friends, and, and, and I am very immersed in both worlds. Yes, yeah, you and, are, and, and totally. And it's been a huge blessing. I've always been disappointed that it feels like we say you have to choose between liturgical sacramental worship and wonderful fellowship music and teaching. Hmm. And, and it's like saying you can have breakfast or lunch. Which one do you want? And it's like, well, both, they're different. Yeah. And it's like, nope, sorry, you got breakfast or lunch. And, and so I think there's something about the local church and, and, and the presence of being there and the sacramental, and we call it the, the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. There's something about, we have to be part of a local church. But darn it, there's something also wonderful about finding the very best of things online and being able to access those. Mm. And so it should be an and not an or. And so for me, you know, I'm going to probably be more apt to send my son to, Hey, look at this homily I found from Switzerland. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, watch this. 
But at the same time, we need to pour into our local parish and church to make it better. But man, I, I think the days of sitting back and watching mediocrity, because mediocrity is not good no matter what it is, whether it's mm-hmm. school, whether it's sports, whether it's the, you know, the going to, to church. And I think that hopefully we'll be a little less tolerant of the kind of mediocrity that can change. You're a professional communicator, writer. <clears throat> I mean, you speak all around the world. If you could coach preachers uh, or people preparing homilies, messages, what's one or two pieces of advice you would have for those of us who communicate? Oh, I love it. I, this is near and dear to my heart because I think that, oh, I love talking about this. Okay. So I overly theatrical and polished is not good. Mm. People see through that. And I would say that very few Catholic pastors are like that because they, they just, they, their, their charism, many of them are not good speakers because okay. that wasn't what they, they didn't, they, they became a priest, not a preacher. Right. Some happen to be good preachers. Most aren't that great. Now, in, in, in the Protestant world, the evangelical world, some of them, that's what their, that's the, that's the centerpiece of their services. Almost your identity. And, how well you preach is how well you do. Let's just exactly. be honest. As a Protestant. Yeah. Right. And so, and that can encourage them to almost be too polished and too performance oriented. So, so I would say to the Catholic ones, hey, be better. Be, and so I, so I came up with an acronym for, for, a great hom, for a great homiletics. Okay. And, and that is, and it's called pour, pour into your homilies, P-O-U-R. Be passionate. Now, but genuinely passionate, but too many Catholic pastors will get up and they'll present something. And, but because they were actually taught in seminary not to be overly dramatic because it can be fake, they almost have come to accept like, <laughs> and I'm mainline like, world in Protestant world too. To yeah, I think extent. that, yeah, they go yeah. together. And it's like, yeah. no, 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 no. We need to know you actually believe and care about what you're saying, right? Yep. Now that doesn't mean it's over the top, but be passionate. You don't have to be a great speaker to be passionate. In fact, the best homilists aren't necessarily great speakers. It's, they're, they're, they're talking about Jesus from their heart, right? So that's the P, be passionate. The second one is, oh, be organized. Don't, don't go from A to B to C to Z to A to B. And it's so common. This is one of the biggest problems I have. Yeah. It's like at the end of the homily, we're like, I don't even remember what the point was. <laughs> so I think that is the, the, the single biggest one. So P, O, be, be passionate, be organized, be understandable. Mm-hmm. And understandable mainly is use language that people know what you're saying. And sometimes we can be too th- um, theological and use words, or, or we can talk in ways that, uh, we use words that are insider stuff, like p- bubble people, like, well, I'm a pastor, so I'm gonna talk about this and this. And it's like, no, no, no. Use the language of the people hearing you, not the language of your profession. And that's the you. And then the R is, and then make it relevant. Mm. Tell people, like, this is why this matters in your life today. And so I would say, when in doubt, do poor, and when in doubt, make it shorter than longer. Yeah. Because people, people can remember a few things. And so, Carrie, I, go to, I used to go to daily mass. I'd go to mass. Next time you come out, we'll go together. And I would love that. the homily at daily mass is literally four minutes. Okay, wow. The, the best homilies I ever hear at daily mass. Because the priest goes up there, he's got you know, no time to do it. He's like, okay, this is what Jesus said in the gospel. And think about this. Today, when you go out back to work or when you go into your lives, do what Jesus said, because this is what he meant. And all right, so let's go on with mass. And I always remember it. I come back to the office and say, hey, you guys, this was a great message. (laughs) Whereas then we go to Sunday and they string it out longer. And I just, I can't even remember what they said. That doesn't mean longer is bad, but if Mm. longer means it's harder to remember and harder to act on. That's not as I love it. I love it too, because I know you're hyper involved, but it's a lay person's perspective, right? right? At the end of the day, this is not your day job. And you're the kind of person we're trying to minister to and help and equip and disciple. I think that's amazing feedback. And you know something else, Carrie? I've seen African or Filipino priests whose, lang- whose, whose language wasn't that clear, but they speak from their heart. It's organized. Uh-huh. They use, they use the words because they have to choose the words and it's relevant. And it's like, that was fantastic. Yeah. And some other priest who's kind of charismatic, but disorganized and it doesn't seem authentic. And, and I love the fact that my 14 year old and my 17 year old will go, 
nah, I didn't buy that. Mm-hmm. People, people want authenticity. That's uh, so helpful. Well, I'm going to take notes. I'm preaching this Sunday. So I'm going right. to try to be I bet uh, you're passionate, organized, understandable, and relevant. There we go. Uh, hey, we do have to talk about your book while we've got you together. For those of you who might be watching, it's called The Motive. Uh, I, you put a copy in my hands last time we were together, and it's a fantastic book. I read it on oh, the flight you. home. Um, and one that you said you should have started with this one, right? So yeah. why did you write The Motive? You know, most books on leadership and management, including mine, are about how to be a better leader, right? Which is great. But years ago, a few, just a few years ago, I realized that if a person isn't a leader, isn't being a leader for the wrong reason, if, they're, if they're, they don't know why they're being a leader or if they're, their reason for being a leader, their motive is wrong, the advice I'm going to give them about how to lead is not going to make sense. Because if you, and there's two real motives at the most, the most basic level, there's two reasons why somebody should want to be a leader hmm. or w- does want to be a leader. One is because darn it, it's a reward. It's hmm. like, it's a really cool thing to be a leader. I'm going to make more money or I'm going to be more famous or I'm going to have more inf- influence or I'm going to have more fun or people are going to respect me more and my day-to-day life and my overall cocktail party status is going to go up. Hmm. And let me tell you, most human beings when they're young are drawn to those things. Right. You know, I wanted, I was a leader when I was a kid. I wanted to be the student body president. I was and a captain of my team and that kind of stuff. But if you really ask a kid, it's like, yeah, people think I'm cool. Right. And we're Natural not Natural like, progression. I've worked hard. I paid my dues. It's time for me to be promoted. Exactly. I get to call all the shots. Yeah. And when that is your motive... When you tell somebody what they have to do to be a leader, much of which is self-sacrificing and hard, they're like, well, why, if, if I did it for those other reasons, why would I do something that's actually harder for me? Whereas the, the real reason, the best motive for being a leader, the other one, the second one is, because the first one is called reward centered. The other one is called, um, I, I always get it wrong, I'm going to say service centered. It's responsibility centered. And that is, I am taking on a daunting responsibility. This is a huge potential it's a burden and and it's a sacrifice for others and i i i I do it because i'm called to it's a vocation it's like a Mm. vocation to the to the to being a minister and i am signing up for it's like being a vocation of being a parent if my reason for being a parent is because it's nice to have kids around and it looks good on the Christmas card and it can be fun at times and I want to coach some of their teams, but I don't really want to change their diapers or be there when they're up at night or help them prepare for a test. That's bad for kids. But if I say I'm going to become a parent and if that means my son or daughter has a crippling disease or decides to take an interest in a subject that I'm not interested in, I am going to do that. When it's hard, that's when we know it's right. And so many leaders shy away from the hard and unpleasant things because their motive for becoming a leader was wrong in the first place. And you make in the, the book, argument. Oh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, in the book, these two CEOs in what I think is probably my kind of edgiest fiction in terms of they confront one another who have very different motives for leading really challenge and confront one another. And, and one of the guys who's learned the hard way just calls the other guy out and there's a lot of twists and turns and drama and surprises. Um, but they really get at the underlying reason why they want to become a leader. And, um, I'm surprised at the reaction we've received from people. I think it's, I think this has been one of my, but now it came out right before the crisis. So the sales have been, most people aren't doing a lot of business reading, but I think the response so far has been overwhelmingly more positive than any book I've read. I've written almost. It's very emotional. It's very convicting. Right. Um, That's what I should say. I think you make the argument that most people, uh, most CEOs, and this is true in church leadership, business leadership, but most people in that senior leader seat actually intentionally or unintentionally operate out of a rewards style of leadership, right? So can you describe that for people? Like what what do reward-centered leaders do that responsibility leader-centered leaders don't do? Um. Reward-centered leaders are looking for activities that, that enhance their own enjoyment and status. Mm. You know, and, and, and by the way, it's not black or white. I, I think generally I'm a very responsibility-centered leader, but I've slid 
at times. And there's things I do that I, and so what I love about this book, Carrie, is that CEOs have read it and said, oh crap, this knocked me down. I realize I'm doing a lot of things for reward and not for responsibility. I need to change. So it's not one of those black or white, like, why would anybody read this? They're either one or the other. We can easily succumb to, you know, reward-centered leadership. And I think an, an interesting way to look at it is, what is it that responsibility-centered leaders do that reward-centered leaders won't? So let's do that. What, what yeah. will a responsibility-centered leader do? Right. And, and they will, even though it's unpleasant, they will have really difficult conversations with people that work for them, with vendors, with customers, but more, mostly with people in their organization when the last thing they want to do is have to talk to somebody about something behavioral or uncomfortable. They need to realize if they won't do it, nobody else will. And you can't abdicate or delegate that. The CEO needs to know that they have to suffer through more difficult conversations than anybody else, or they're going to send a message that it's okay to avoid those. It's sort of a Michael Scott-like. I mean, Michael Scott oh. is the uh, the best boss we all love to, but I mean, he was, he was an example of like, I don't want to be the unpopular guy. I want everyone to like me. Uh, all, all that stuff, which you poke at in the book, is so helpful. And I mean, I got to be honest with you, difficult conversations are still hard for me a quarter century in. And oh, sometimes and I'd rather that will never it. change. Same with you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't stand it. But what, what, when, I, when, I, when I look at it and go, I don't want to do that, and I realize, ah, oh, that's because I have a natural human desire to avoid unpleasantness. But my desire to avoid unpleasantness is going to cause other people to experience even more unpleasantness as a result of that. Uh, and, and that's, and boy, in the church world, that one, that first one, there's five things that, that reward-centered leaders don't like to do. Having difficult conversations is one of them, and so many pastors. Yeah. And because, and it's easy for a pastor to hide behind, well, I need to be nice. We believe in grace here. It's all grace. Yes, yeah. Exactly. Whereas real grace would, would be to go to somebody and say, hey, this isn't going well. I need you to change your behavior. I love you. I, I, I will forgive you for that. I, I give lots of grace, but you need to change. You need to grow. I love you so much that I can't let you wallow in this. So that's, that's number love. one, avoiding difficult yeah. conversations. Yep. Another one is, is um, I mean, there's, there's five. I'm trying to think of the, my favorite one to talk about. The, the next one is very interesting, and that is just to manage your direct reports. Mm. Many leaders, especially like they become CEOs, and this is my biggest challenge. It's like they go, well, I hire adults. I trust them. I don't want to micromanage them. So, you know, I'm just going to let them manage themselves. <laughs> um, and I don't care if you're the senior vice president of marketing at a multi-billion dollar corporation. You need to be managed by your manager. That's why they exist. And the higher you go up in an organization, the more you see leaders abdicating responsibility for that. Mm. And, 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 but I see this in pastors and other people too. They're like, hey, listen, my, my call was to preaching and to, and to pastoral care. I, I shouldn't have to know what the goals of my, peop, my employees are and, and coach them to get better in those areas. They, I, you know, she's better at at, at music ministry or at Bible study or at administration than I am. So I'm just going to let them manage themselves. Right. And that happens all the time and it leaves people open to real suffering in an organization. What are the implications of not managing and not having uh, hard conversations? Like what, what happens down the road? Follow that trail. What, what takes place? It's a great question, Carrie. Silos creep up. Yeah. Um, people start to talk about each other because the leader is not confronting them about their behavior and everybody sees that. So they're like, oh man, here comes Mary. Well, get ready for this. This is going to be a terrible meeting and he's never going to call her on that. It actually opens us up to dysfunction and I would even say sin, yeah. right? Imagine if the apostles, if one of the apostles was constantly doing something destructive and Jesus didn't call them on it, they would go, well, if Jesus isn't calling them on it, who am I to call them on it? And True. now I'm just going to vent. I mean, it, there's no love in not confronting people about their behavior or their performance. And it doesn't serve that person. It doesn't serve the group and it doesn't serve the culture. 
And yet we find reasons to do that because we don't want to be unpopular or we don't want to be uncomfortable. I think that's the biggest one. Mm. We don't want to wade through that. And Alan Mulally, the CEO who turned Ford Motor Company around, the most important thing he did is he held his executives accountable for their behaviors. And he would just go to them and say, you can't talk to people like that during meetings. Wow. Lovingly. And they'd go, well, I don't know if I can change. He goes, that's okay. We could still be friends. You just can't work here. But, but I, I'll still be your friend, and I know it's hard, and I don't want you to think I won't like you, but to work here at this church means when you come to meetings, you're going to have to admit when you're wrong. You can do it. I struggle with it too. You know, that yeah. kind of stuff. Is that tied to the pattern? It's a pattern I've seen numerous times, something I have to check regularly in myself where you don't say anything, you know, I, I don't want to confront, I don't want to hold accountable, but it's all building up inside. Next thing you know, you're calling that person into your office. It's like, well, this is it. We've come to the end of the road. You're fired. So, and they're shocked because they had no idea. Happens all the time. Yeah. I see that in church world all the time. Oh, yeah. And, and then th- look, think about that. Yeah. And then they leave and they say, I can't believe they were so cruel. Mm-hmm. And, and even other people in church go, you mean they fired the person in charge of this? And the, the, and, and the truth of the matter is, yes, because they were so intent on being nice, not kind and loving, but nice, that they actually ended up being cruel. You know, you remember, the, you know, that song, you have to be cruel to be kind. I never liked I do, it. Yeah, it's not Nick cruel. Will. But to love guy. someone, you have to have, tough love is a real thing. Jesus was the, 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 the you know, he, tough love was what he did. That People are like, I think people are, are surprised that he was crucified because they, they envision him walking around with a guitar and, and, and uh, flip-flops and telling everybody like easy things. Like, man, just love one another. Hey, no, he was confronting them about behaviors that were at the core of society and the core of the human heart. And he was doing it in love, but that didn't sit well with people. No, you're and right. We think, well, I'm a pastor now in the 21st century. I should never, I should just affirm people in all things. And that's act, that is actually a form of cruelty. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. You also, uh, if, you, if you have time, I'd love to talk to you about meetings because you wrote a whole book on it, Death by Meeting. Yeah. I must admit, that's probably an Achilles heel for me. Accountability, which I'm learning, you know, you learn as you get older. Uh, but meetings, uh, I mean, let's, let's talk about that. What, what is the problem with meetings and CEOs who are reward-based? Yeah, reward-based CEOs go, okay, meetings are boring to me and painful, and I, don't, I feel like we don't get anything done, and people complain about them. So this doesn't serve me at all. And so their first reaction is, so I'm going to have fewer of them, I'm going to make them shorter, and I'm not going to go to any that I don't feel like going to. And it's like, no. That's like saying, I don't like changing diapers, I'm a parent, so I'm going to avoid having to change them. Whenever I have it here, smell that smell, I'm going to leave the room and hope somebody else does this. Well, that's not a good idea. And, yeah. and, and the truth of the matter is meetings are not like diapers. They actually should be fantastic. Fantastic means they should be focused and, and exhausting and compelling because there's, there's like healthy conflict there. The stakes are high. And it's only the leader who can do that. Mm-hmm. If the leader of an organ, a, a CEO is the chief meeting officer, the chief accountability officer, the chief management officer. And yet those are the things they're like, no, I'm going to delegate the meetings to my chief operating officer. I won't even go to him. I'm going to de- delegate difficult conversations to HR. I'm going to delegate management. Well, I'll just abdicate that when people do it. To, I'll delegate that to themselves. They find all these reasons not to do things that only they can set the tone for in the organization. And meetings can be great only if the CEO works at it. And it's, it's tedious at times and uncomfortable at times. So two things. One, I can hear a lot of leaders in their heads saying right now, well, that doesn't sound like a very fun job, Pat. <laughs> but that's I love the point, it. isn't it? I would love it if more people said, well, wow, being a leader doesn't seem all that rewarding because nobody should go into it for the rewards. Uh-huh. Unless they're, they feel a sense of reward from it, it's, like, it's like going into the priesthood or going into ministry. If you're doing it for what it does for you, and, and by the way, there's a lot of reward. 
Oh yeah. Like if, if, if you say to somebody, Hey, you want to be a minister? And they're like, yeah. And they're imagining themselves up on stage, giving a great homily and inspiring people. That's fine. But it's like, what about the time where you have to tell people things and they don't receive it well because it's hard to hear? Or what about when they call you in the middle of the night and that same lady who you actually don't like to be with, you're going to have to go sit with her and hold her hand. Mm -hmm. Or what about when you got to ask people for money and you'd rather just create a committee of people to do stewardship or whatever. If you're doing it just for the parts of it that feed you, you're not going to do a good job at it. And, and I like to say at the beginning of the book, I talk about graduation ceremonies where people give speeches and they say, go out and be a leader, change the world. I always want to stand up and say, no, unless you want to suffer for others, don't be a leader. And I actually think the world would be better off if fewer people aspired to be leaders, but they all did it for the right reason. Because then I think that we wouldn't have so much cynicism and disillusionment among the people being led. What is of the five things that you raise in the book? And people should get the book. It's a short book. What was the most Yeah, it's my shortest book you? yet. That's my best selling point. <laughs> <laughs> what was the, what's the hardest one for you? Still. Managing people. Yeah. Because I'm not a detailed person. Right. So I don't love the, the difficult conversations, but the pain I see around me and the lack of excellence in the organization, I have a hard time controlling that. Mm -hmm. And I need to do that earlier and calmer. But, but it's the managing people. It's like, oh, I don't need to stay on top of the details. So I'm not good at that. I'm an ENFP and I like the big picture. And I like to say like, I'm, I'm more drawn to leadership than management, but you got to do both. Yeah. I would say that that parallels my journey as well. I think it's a nice short book. It's a good reread. I think this is one of those that I'm going to end up picking up um, on a semi-regular basis because I find in my own prayer life, like it's just a motive check every day. It's just like, I got to keep checking my motives. Well, it, and today I woke up and I did it. I had a great podcast with the people at World Vision yesterday yeah. and, they, and it was all about, it turned out to be all about faith. And I woke up this morning and I talked about this every morning. Like I was going into the bathroom to take a shower and I was like, Jesus, your will, not mine. Wow. If you have something hard for me today that I don't feel like doing, let I want to walk into that. I don't want to wake up and like have my head on a swivel looking for the easy and just the fun things. That doesn't mean there's not a place for fun. But if I'm a leader and a parent, I have to do what's put in front of me before I do what I want to put in front of myself. It's wow. as simple as that, but that's easy to say and hard to do. The good word. The book is called The Motive, Why So Many Leaders Abdicate Their Most Important Responsibilities. It's available anywhere you get books. Pat, uh, best place to look you up online is? Our website has lots of stuff at www, of, of course, tablegroup.com. Table, like kitchen table. Yeah. Tablegroup.com. There's all kinds of free resources and stuff and videos and yada, yada, yada. We're during this time, we're giving, we're putting more things out there and giving things away. We just want people to make their organizations healthier, especially during this time when people are so stressed. Pat, as always, it's a pure joy. Thank you so much for being with us today on the podcast. You know, I have to go write another book just so I can do another podcast with you. It's so fun. All right, that's a deal. Or how about a standing invitation? <laughs> how about we go to mass and then we uh, debrief it next time? Does that sound that good? That sounds awesome. Hey, thank Carrie, you. thank you so much. It really is a pleasure. God bless you. Thank you. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before. <laughs>